You know, it's an interesting thread. Uh, we've hopefully you've picked up on here. Truth is what we choose to pursue as an organization. Goodness is what is one thing that uh, we choose to see um, in our organization. And I'm going to hopefully give you an idea of how we as teachers can use, utilize beauty as a means of unlocking this. So gentlemen, I see your truth, I see your goodness, but I'm gonna raise you the idea of beauty. And I wanna begin here. You know, we could argue, is beauty capable of being defined? Is it subjective or objective? Is it in the eye of the beholder or can we claim that beauty exists? I'm not gonna get into the argument. I'm just gonna tell you, sorry Judith. I'm just gonna tell you, in the classical tradition, we actually hold fast to the idea that beauty is an objective transcendental quality that is both measurable and discernible. I'm gonna to appeal to Aristotle as well. Aristotle hints that beauty is recognized when the component parts of an object make a coherent, orderly whole. It's a good definition. It's a good working definition of something that's beautiful when the component parts make up a coherent whole. He says himself that to be beautiful, a living creature and every whole made up of parts must present a certain order in its arrangements. And in another place in the metaphysics, metaphysics he comes back to the idea and says the chief forms of beauty are order and symmetry and definiteness, which the mathematical sciences actually demonstrate to a special degree. And to begin with this idea that, that beauty is, is somehow found in the relationship between parts and a whole is a useful definition and one that I think will serve you well in your class and us well to distinguish that which is beautiful from that which is not. Because if you stop for a moment and realize that if you hear a discordant note or see a chaotic composition or you see an unbalanced equation, it falls short of our concept of beauty. In fact, they stick out in our mind. Uh, it seems that the disordered, the unharmonious, can be easily recognized, even instinctively known. So I would argue that the opposite is also true. However, beauty is not just in order or balance, but there's actually something greater. Because in beauty, there's a form of synergy where the whole is greater than the, the sum value of the component parts. A poem is beautiful when every word and every line coalesce into unspoken awe at the beauty of language. A painting is beautiful when each brushstroke and hint of color draws the viewer in deeper until you are lost in the viewing. And an equation is beautiful when the interplay of variables reaches such astonishing clarity that an elegant solution emerges with great explanatory power. These are moments when we're struck with beauty. I want to give you an example. I learned this recently. I went to the Traveling Van Gogh exhibit, Immersive Van Gogh, fantastic opportunity. It's one of his famous paintings called The Starry Night. Not the one you're thinking of, but this is Starry Night over the Rhone. And I want to look for a moment at some of the key components here to this. You'll notice his fascination with the stars. Early in Van Gogh's uh, travels to Arles, he became fascinated with the stars. And here he shows the stars with a certain radiant beauty. However, it is not the stars that are the highlight of this particular composition. It is actually the light reflected from the town onto the river that draws your attention. It's interesting to note that because with this with this view of the stars, yet he seems to be noting that artificial, the, the man-made light, is more important. An image that's only reinforced, if you can see, by this couple down here who are strolling confidently and happily at night along the banks of the river, perhaps engaged in a romantic moment. Why are they so happy and confident? It's the light of the town that seems to be illuminating their path. Perhaps this re reflects Van Gogh's early uh, attempts at painting when everything was new and fresh and exciting. And he had this hope, he had this hope in what mankind was capable of, of conquering the darkness, of illuminating the path. And then we have the more famous Starry Night, which you probably know was painted from the window of his mental asylum at the, towards the end of his most prolific period. And notice the differences. First of all, here's the town, but where is the light of the town? The, the, the light has been diminished greatly. And in its place, we have the wheeling heavens. 
the flow, the dynamic energy, the light that emanates from this celestial realm. It's almost as if he's given up on mankind and mankind's potential and now sees that there can only be hope in the heavens, in something greater than himself. And instead of the couple in the foreground, instead we get this silhouette of the cypress tree. Interestingly, it bisects the natural and the celestial realm, reaching up for the divine, perhaps seeking for some kind of consolation, some kind of truth, some kind of touch of the divine to bring meaning to what is happening. Perhaps it's even a representation of the artist himself, struggling, reaching for that connection, but destined like this tree to remain forever in darkness. Whether or not the interpretation of the painting is accurate, understanding how component parts work together to, to tell a coherent whole is rooted in the idea of defining something as beautiful. I find it fascinating to just think of what he might have been trying to say. Aristotle, if you recall, though, in his definition, he singled out mathematics as being a particularly beautiful way of expressing ideas. It's interesting how closely he integrated beauty and mathematics. However, it does make sense, and all of your math teachers, I'm sure you're nodding right now, mathematics is an expression of order and symmetry and component harmony unlike anything else. These days, if a new idea is going to be accepted by the scientific community, it must be accurate, of course. It must be simple. That's something that's been held to be true for a while. But it also must be elegant. It's an interesting twist to Occam's razor that arguably now elegance and beauty and symmetry must be seen to be woven through the fabric of the cosmos in any new law or any new expression. And these are expressed mathematically to represent real physical phenomena, laws of the universe, in their simplest and most elegant terms. Math also meets the, the, the requirement of symmetry as well, because we know that the explanatory power of a single equation is greater than the, the explanatory power of each component variable. Math is beautiful. Right? Beauty is mathematical. Aristotle said it first, and I want you math teachers, your challenge is you have to reveal this to your students on a daily basis. You have to recognize it. You have to convince them of it. You have to show them that it's true. But this definition goes further because we could argue that the first criteria for any book or work of art to be part of the classical canon is that the work must be beautiful in this sense. It conforms to the mathematical definition of beauty. In other words, it must convey in simple elegance with deep harmony and realistic symmetry some sense of what is true or good about the world around us. But I say more than that. Beauty has the power to lift the head of the observer and to open your eyes to possibilities broader and deeper and longer or higher than we have previously imagined because beauty rings true to our senses. It conforms to what we sense is right, but also inspires us to believe in something more. And if our students are filled with beauty, this kind of beauty, the original beauty, not the Mattel version, not the Disney reboot, right? If our students' minds are filled with beauty, they begin to infiltrate and influence their minds until they're quickened to the truth. And you've all seen this moment when it occurs. It's that moment when the light comes on in their eyes. You've seen it as a teacher, and you know that it's the moment that, that fills you with joy and keeps you going, waiting for the next occasion for it to occur. And it's then at that moment that we know we've done our jobs well. With this in mind, I would argue that we have to regard beauty as an emotional apprehension of truth and goodness, felt rather than completely understood, apprehended, yes, but not fully comprehended. And beauty must be rooted in the imagination, because often we're struck intelligible at a beautiful sight, but we feel it strongly. This is not to say that it is imaginary, but rather, to borrow a phrase, beauty is an activity of the imagination. 
in accordance with virtue. As such, the act of contemplating beauty has transformative power. It can make a person better. Indeed, something beautiful will transport us out of ourselves and our ordinary surroundings into somewhere that is higher, richer, more textured, and exciting. Life is given more meaning. You know, an architect will mirror this effect in the stone lines and vaulted ceiling of cathedral, for it draws our eyes upwards towards the stained glass heavens above. Interestingly, though, when man stands in contemplation of that which is greater than himself, he is not diminished by the comparison, but rather he is elevated in both mind and spirit. And it's this elevation of mind and spirit that will transform the lives of our students. James Joyce once wrote, truth is beheld by the intellect, which is appeased by the most satisfying relations of the intelligible, but beauty is beheld by the imagination, which is appeased by the most satisfying relations of the sensible. In other words, the sensible, that which we can sense and understand when placed in the correct arrangement becomes beautiful and transformative. Assuming this to be true, I challenge you to work to reify this possibility in the students that you teach. For it's obvious to any one of us that's taught for any length of time, the way to engage students is to capture their imagination. Dream then about the power of beauty in your classroom because beauty inhabits the imagination. Think of its possible effect. If students can be made to attune themselves to the observation and contemplation of something beautiful, we as teachers have made a significant and lasting difference in their lives, possibly even an improvement. And when it occurs in class, it is through exposure to the things that we have chosen for them to see. So choose carefully. There is an obvious obstacle, of course. Many students will not want to make time or give permission for the contemplation of things that are truly beautiful. They've been fed a diet of junk food alternatives and cheap facsimiles their entire life. In fact, once they leave our campus, sometimes even before, as soon as that phone comes out of their pocket, they're subsumed into the world of pop culture. Therefore, I say to you in your classes, do not feed that addiction. There needs to be a separation, a change, a reattuning of their imagination towards that which is better. Because that's what our students really need. We must grant them access to what is complex and understand what obstacles they have to overcome to engage in this act of contemplation, to make their great works desirable, give the time for soul transformation. This is a special gift and mission of teaching. It is to make students desire what is best for themselves, not simply what is good, even though what is good is typically superior to what they normally want but to inspire that desire, that love, that attention to what is best. I want to give you an example of what I'm discussing. This example incorporates two main ideas I've emphasized. Number one, the transformative power of contemplating something that is beautiful, and two, the role of the teacher to make this accessible. I'd like to read this poem to you on first looking into Chapman's Homer by John Keats. Much have I traveled in the realms of gold, many goodly states and kingdoms seen. Round many western islands have I been, which bards in fealty to Apollo hold. Oft of one wide expanse had I been told that deep-browed Homer ruled as his demean. Yet did I never breathe its pure serene till I heard Chapman speak out loud and bold. Then, then felt I like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the Pacific and with all of his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. Notice at the start of the poem how the poet is bored. He's gone around this country again and again. Can't He's heard other people talk about how great it is. He can't really see it for himself. Right? He knows that there's something good here, but
but it's not accessible to him until one thing changes, and that's when Chapman gives his translation. When Chapman speaks, suddenly the voice is loud and clear. Suddenly the descriptions ring true. And look at how it transforms the mind of the poet. Suddenly go, going from this state of boredom, I've seen it all before, it's like he's discovering some new planet. Didn't notice it before. There it is. Look at that. Look at the awe. Think of the moment if you were there discovering that new planet. Or like the conquistadors. We recognize Balboa doesn't fit here, but he's the more accurate description historically. Balboa climbed the mountains of Darien in Panama with his men, became the first Western European to see the Pacific Ocean from the eastern side. And in that moment, when they thought they had conquered, what are they confronted with? Yet another ocean. Yet another expanse to cross. Yet another journey to take. Even further, as it would turn out, than the first one. And his men and he are struck dumb with this beautiful sight. And yet, they come up with a wild surmise. You know, what would that surmise be? It would be, the journey's not over. The adventure has only just begun. We've got a long way to go. What made the difference in the life of this man? It was the way that his teacher explained to him what he was looking at. So now he could look at every old story again, with, now with awestruck wonder, dumbfounded by the immensity of the horizon that's been introduced to him. Here is the effect of the great teacher. Chapman made the beautiful accessible. Gave him an opportunity to be fresh and exciting and important in the minds of his students. And here is the effect of beauty on the beholder awestruck silence and a wild surmise. Can you imagine every day if your students were struck silent by the awesome things they were discovering in your class? And then pair that with the wild idea that they get next? Reminds me of the day I met my wife. I'm sorry, Jody, I was trying to resist bringing you up, but I'll tell this part of the story. Ran into her, struck dumb, <laughs> felt, felt like an idiot with every word that fell from my mouth, and yet I had this wild idea, I'm going to marry her one day. It took a while, but it happened. <laughs> but isn't that the, the effect of beauty? What a, what a profound concept to be struck dumb and to have a wild idea at the same time. This is how beauty can transform. This is how beauty can unlock. This is how beauty can, can, can uh, improve the quality of our classrooms by making our students, challenging them to look beyond themselves and their circumstances and to look for this golden realm of possibility that lies just beyond, just beyond what they thought they were getting into. Which brings me really to my final point. I'm not just saying this because it's a good idea or a suggestion or a, suggestion or a lofty, impractical, philosophical aspiration. I would actually encourage you that this is your job. You are here to inspire. You are here to teach truth, to love the good, and to lead encounters with beauty. You were chosen to be here today to breathe life into the curriculum, and to use it to inspire our students. And I'd like to charge you this year to do that well, to do that to the best of your ability, because it will change the lives of the people that you encounter.